Looking forward to the talk. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you so much, Annie. I, I should stand up and say thank you. Uh, I'm only sitting down, so the aspect ratio with the camera is good. Otherwise, I'll be constantly bending down. So th this is a, a new talk for me. So I'm looking for feedback. It's a new uh, topic for me, in fact, something that I really started in earnest after moving uh, to NUS. It's what I call robot imagination, uh, and it's related to uh, the affordance-based reasoning about objects. So I'll explain what this uh, all means, uh, but I also have ulterior motives. Uh, as a department head, I'm always looking for good people. So I'll tell you a little bit about NUS and NUS mechanical engineering, uh, and then also talk about some of the older work that I've done before uh, going into this new work uh, on affordance of, of objects, uh, new for me, uh, for my group, and something that we call a spirit dictionary. So I'll explain what, what that means as well. So first of all, about uh, Singapore and NUS. So here's a map of Asia. Not everybody knows where Singapore is. I think maybe the people here probably know, but you know, here's Taiwan, uh, here's Hainan Island, here's Hong Kong. Singapore is way down here at the tip of Malaysia, okay? And uh, so, and it's a, you know, uh, a port, uh, famous uh, trading port, uh, British colony for uh, 100, I guess 200 years. And, uh, uh, and uh, now, a center for trade and for air travel. Oh, well, not so much air travel these days, but still uh, trade. Uh, NUS is, a, is the National University of Singapore. It has about 40,000 students. About 25% are postgraduate, masters and PhD. Uh, and uh, we have uh, competitive startup salaries and uh, 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 packages, sorry, competitive salaries and startup packages. Uh, and uh, the, the faculty housing is right across the street with two swimming pools and uh, a bridge right across the road to campus. And uh, consist, NUS consistently ranks uh, very well in the world rankings. And you can see these here. Uh, since I've been department head there, uh, these are the people, including myself, who have joined. Uh, I'll, I'll point out a few. Uh, these two ladies, um, Tan Yu Jun and Sun Mi Shin, were in the top uh, in the 30 MIT Review 35 Under 35 for Asia. Uh, Cecilia Lasky over here is a famous uh, soft robotics person, famous for the octopus arm. Uh, uh, Guillaume here was one of Howie Chosett's students. Uh, these two here are Jason Ku came from MIT and Hong Yang Zhang came from EPFL. They work on origami design. And then we have a bunch of 3D printing people in here, a battery guy. Uh, and uh, Gian Marco here, his work is uh, on the cover of this month's uh, Siam Review. So we're quite a, quite a good group. Uh, the people who were there were already good. And I feel uh, proud that I've been able to hire these good people so far, and we're hiring more as we go along. Okay, so uh, a little bit of history of what I do. For those of you who don't know me, I did my uh, PhD back at Caltech uh, with Joel Burdick and worked on what we call hyper redundant manipulators. Uh, and these are two examples, this is an example of two different configurations for grasping and obstacle avoidance. Uh, and this is a little bit tongue in cheek. I say hyper redundancy resolution, uh, a concept whose time has come again, because uh, these days there's quite a lot of work on continuum robots and soft robots. And uh, many of the same modeling techniques that were used back then have been you know, reinvented recently. Uh, and even some of the words about you know, snakes, elephant trunks and tentacles, uh, the idea back then was that using a backbone curve parameterized in the right way and limited in its degrees of freedom uh, using some kind of modal decomposition, uh, which these days they call model reduction, uh, is uh, I think a lot of it was already there. Uh, actually, I'm reminded of some of Ruzhna's talks where she said, you know, the young people don't know what has happened, what would happened in the past. And, I guess I'm feeling the same way. So I, I like to bring up these uh, 
old topics. Another area that we worked in was modular reconfigurable robots and self-replicating robots, robots that can build other robots. And here's a little video uh, of something that my uh, former student, Matt Moses, designed and built. Each of these blocks he, he cast himself in molds. Uh, and they have integrated electronics and motor function. So the idea is that a robot like this, which is a gantry-like robot made of these fancy Lego blocks, uh, can pick in place and put together, assemble a copy of itself. So it's a self-replicating robot. Uh, and so we spent a good amount of time looking at uh, what does self-replication really mean? You know, do you have to build it from raw materials for to be self-replicating and other concepts. And we settled on the idea that there's a degree of self-replication. Uh, and so this has a relatively high degree of self-replication compared to other self-replicating robots you may find in the literature. Um, so this all was inspired by space applications. Uh, and actually, so this was well before my time, the uh, Freitas report from 1980. NASA, the idea was use self-replicating robots to harvest lunar materials. And then I came along 20 years later and uh, gave some uh, texture to that idea. So, but the basic idea is the same. If you use sunlight as power and the lunar sand as the input, can you make a system that can make copies of itself? And uh, these days uh, there may be renewed interest because everybody now is launching rockets and global warming is an issue. Everybody wants to bring the CO2 down, which is great, but maybe we can actually create some kind of shield, some sunglasses using uh, material from the moon to help as well, as far as global warming is concerned, uh, using this kind of paradigm. Other things we've worked on are team diagnosis, where the robots develop hypotheses about the state of the other uh, robots and, and pool them together using Bayesian reasoning and maximum likelihood ideas. And this is one of the places where these lead group methods show up because if you have uncertainty in the pose of a robot, that can be described as a probability distribution on a lead group. And then so we do all kinds of things with mathematics on lead groups. Almost every, anything you can do in Euclidean space, you can do on a lead group. You can convolve functions. There's a concept of Fourier transform and convolution theorem. There's a concept of a mean of a probability density function on a Lie group. There's a concept of a variant covariance of a function, a probability density on a Lie group. And these quantities propagate in a similar way to the way they would in Euclidean space. So in Euclidean space, the, uh, the mean of the convolution is the sum of the means. Here it's the product. Uh, and in Euclidean space, the covariances add under convolution. Here, they kind of add, but you have to process by this so-called adjoint matrix. Um, and so, so basically, uh, whether you're dealing with statistics, probability and statistics and Gaussian distributions uh, or Fourier analysis, it all extends. And so I thought this is very natural as an engineering tool. So, you know, I wrote these various books this one with Kiatkin, who my former postdoc, uh, is now, this is a Dover edition of a, very, a much older book that we wrote 20 years ago. And these are two uh, single author books, the ones that Annie mentioned. I appreciate that. Maybe people have them on their shelves because I mailed out free copies to everybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I'm happy to uh, you know, engage people who are interested in, in, in these as well. OK, so now let's move on to the new things. Uh, in particular, uh, affordance-based uh, definitions of objects and what I call the spirit dictionary. So whereas my old papers are all about, you know, harmonic analysis on Euclidean motion group, convolution theorem, very non-commutative harmonic analysis, my two pa new papers all have very simple titles like, is that a chair? Okay. Or put the bear on the chair. Or prepare the chair for the bear, and I'll show videos of these things, or can I pour into it? Can I lift it? Okay, so it's all from the robot's perspective, and they're either questions or commands being given to the robot. Okay, so what is this robot imagination about? So 
these days, you know, machine learning, particularly deep learning, is very popular. Reinforcement learning, where you have and, and imitation learning, you have lots of training data and you have examples of something. But what we're asking is, what if you don't have examples? How can the robot do some intelligent task when it doesn't have any prior examples to deal with? And the the the, the motivation for this, I was uh, I was on a sabbatical. Uh, in Australia, and I went, I bought some beer, I brought it back to my room, but I didn't have a can opener or a, a bottle opener, okay? And there's various ways you can open two bottles or a bottle, if you, if you, you can use one bottle to open another bottle, or you can put it here, but I didn't want to ruin the table. So how do you open a bottle of beer? Well, it occurred to me I could use the door jam to open the, the bottle of beer, right? Would deep learning ever catch that? I, I Unless you, you've see, seen somebody do it. I guess not. So I started to think uh, in an affordance-based way, the actions uh, that you uh, apply to objects and what functionality an object uh, can afford uh, is, is the important thing, okay? So what we're doing, and I'll, I'll give more motivation here. So this is kind of the current state of robotics, okay? Like in a hotel, you have robots sweeping the floors, you have the little concierge there, um, but uh, you know they're actually not very intelligent. And I didn't stage this, but I knew it was going to happen. Uh, you know, they have no awareness. They just, uh, have, you know, they're very little intelligence. So the question is, how can we endow robots with the kind of intelligence that you know we dream of from science fiction movies? And so in particular, it's a long way to go from cleaning floors to interacting and doing elder care, which is, you know, in Singapore and East Asia in general, that's a big topic, okay? Uh, and for personally, it's a big topic for me because I'm halfway around the world and my mother is aging. It would be nice to have a robot to be able to take care. Um, so, you know, there's related work. I mean, the idea of affordance is I didn't invent it. It goes back to Gibson. And you know, there's quite a lot of work on affordance-based uh, reasoning that already exists, as and the interaction with active vision. And Rushna is the leader in in that. So there's a you know there's a, a history behind every idea, but what the idea that we're talking about here is to develop a dictionary where each item in the dictionary uh, is uh, an affordance-based definition. In other words, it's not appearance-based. It's how the object is used or how, I mean, the, the nouns in the dictionary, of course, there have to be verbs as well. And so, and, you know, uh, I really thought about this for quite a long time. And I, you know, there are people who are focusing on slam. There are people who are focusing on vision or control or motion planning or, you know, each one of these little bricks. And I got this idea while I was working at the National Science Foundation and they have their little brick charts and things. Um, but not a spiral. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but in, in my view, there is something missing in the middle to tie together natural language and knowledge representations and you know, all of these things. Uh, and so the puzzle piece in the middle that from our perspective uh, is important to fill is what we call, well, I mean, it's sort of the spirit is in the middle, right? Like the soul, right? Uh, but that's an acronym, a forced acronym, the spatial information rich interaction based task dictionary, okay, the spirit dictionary. So that's what we're working on. And we have to start somewhere. So we're starting with two nouns chair and cup, okay? What is a chair and what is a cup, okay? Well, a chair is something you sit on and a cup is something you drink from, okay? In, you know, We'll have to crowdsource the definitions to make sure we get all the nuances and maybe even look in Webster's dictionary to start, but that's a starting point, okay? And so the idea is if the robot sees an object and has no prior knowledge, there's no database, it only has the definitions, can it assess, is that a chair or is that a cup, okay? And so that's what we're working on and I'll show examples of how we approach this. So this was an ICRA 2020 paper. The title was, is that a chair? I mean, there's more to the title, but the basic title is, is that a chair? And this was led, led by my student, PhD student, uh, Hong Tao Wu, who's still completing his PhD at Johns Hopkins. 
and uh, Devin Misra, who was an undergraduate visiting at the time. Uh, and uh, so the idea is this, there's many different kinds of chairs, many different appearances. You could train uh, on the appearances. We're not doing that. We're saying you have an unseen object there. Is it a chair? How do you determine if it's a chair? Well, well, let's, let's, let's do the straw man first. If you do a learning-based approach, this tiny little chair looks like a chair. You go to the amusement park, the teacup ride looks like a chair, okay? Uh, picture on the wall looks like a chair, uh, but is it a chair? And so we take the approach of uh, having the robot imagine, can I sit on it or can I set somebody on it, okay? And what is this imagination, this physical imagination? Well, it's mechanics-based simulation. The robot has a simulator like Pi Bullet or Gazebo, and the robot can uh, first needs to scan the unknown object and reconstruct it, then put it in a simulator, and then ask, can an, an agent sit on it, okay? Now, even if it is classified as a chair, it may not be at the correct orientation to sit on, so that needs to be assessed as well. So, uh, so the first thing we do is we take the scan of the object and we drop it many different ways. And we see where it settles because you can't sit on a chair if it's not stable. So we look at all the stable poses of the object and the object might not be a chair, it might be some other thing, okay? Then we take a humanoid figure and we drop it on the chair in all of these different poses because we don't know a priori. The robot has never seen this chair before or this object it doesn't know if it's a chair or not. So uh, basically it's a combination of first determining the stable poses of the chair, then determining if a humanoid figure can sit on it in that orientation. Okay, and if it can, then we not only know it's a chair or can be used as a chair, which we're not making that distinction. If it can be used as a chair, it is a chair, right? From this perspective. Uh, but we get that information of classification and simultaneously how to sit or set some, uh, a humanoid on the chair. So here's some, uh, you know, here's some more uh, results. Here, are, here's how the simulation works. You know, we drop the humanoid figure, and then if it, if, and we drop the humanoid figure at different orientations, and then if there's any that's stable, then it's a candidate for the correct, what we call the functional pose of the object to afford the sitting uh, up, uh, action, okay? So here's a, a more recent thing. This is actually unpublished. It's in review for ICRA 2022. So we had, we had previously, is that a chair? We, we know how to determine if something is a chair. Now it's put the bear on the chair, okay? So uh, this again is led by Hong Tao, but also with my NUS student, Mong Shen, and postdoc at NUS, uh, Sipu Ruan, who was my student at Johns Hopkins. Uh, so the, uh, the robot arm goes around and does a 3D scan, takes the scan, uses the chair assessment, determines that the object is a chair. Oh, and then my volume is, is, uh, is low, but I'll just paraphrase. The now is asking, uh, it's saying, yes, I've the we've assessed that this is a chair, but it's not at the right orientation for me to put a teddy bear on it. Please help me turn it to this angle so that I can put the teddy bear on it, okay? And then, then it's asking, please give me the teddy bear, okay? And so then uh, my other student will come and give the teddy bear, and then the now will track, it's being tracked by this uh, arm, which has the 3D tracker on it, and then puts it on the chair. So literally this is about putting the bear on the chair, okay? That's what this paper is about, okay? Uh, and it's not always the case that the chair is sitting right in front. It's sometimes tilted and the robot has to move around. So it's the unification of planning, perception, and this affordance-based reasoning, okay? I'm just going to let this keep going because there's different variations. And uh, this uh, video is actually embedded into the slide. So, so anyway, there you go, a success story of the, the bears on the chair. So, uh, and then we do all kinds of different chair and chair-like objects, okay? And uh, each time we have extremely high success rate, independent of the appearance of the chair, 
and uh, the orientation of the chair. Of course, if the chair is turned opposite, then the robot says, please turn the chair so I can reach. Um, and uh, oh, here we put a little trick in where the, ro the robot says, please turn the chair this much. And then the, per the human is naughty and doesn't, turns it the wrong way. And then, uh, you know, then the robot either says, please turn it again, or, uh, uh, or I can reach it as is. Um, so all kinds of different chair shapes. Uh, there should be one coming up, which I think you might find as an interesting chair. Uh, let's see. Oh, yes, this one on the lower left. That was a chair made up of my books. <laughs> okay, so uh, the, the, that collection of books, yeah, over here in the lower left is a, is a shipping container models and my books. So is that a chair? Would, would that be recognized as a chair using other methods? Well, it affords the sitting uh, action. So from our perspective, it is a chair, okay? From the teddy bear's perspective, it looks like a chair too. Um, so success after success after success, and it's fully explainable, okay? Because it's all about physics-based uh, simulation of the environment, okay? So, uh, okay, the next work is prepare the chair for the bear, okay? Um, and these are on the archive, but not yet published. So now the chair is in this weird orientation. It doesn't know it's a chair, uh, but the, the, uh, the Franca robot here takes a 3D scan. It does recognize the barcode, so it knows we have these universal grapple lugs, so these handles so that the robot can, if these are attached to any object, it can pick it up. That's not assessing what the object is, that's just being able to grab the object. And then uh, it assessed that this is the way uh, to reorient the chair and then it takes a scan again. Uh, and then from this or orientation, it can put it into the simulator and then we can do what was in the previous, uh, in the previous slide. So in, in fact, it's, it's reorienting it again uh, to make it uh, reachable by the robot. So this was a priori unseen object, uh, characterizing it, uh, as a chair, putting it in the right orientation for the humanoid robot to uh, to place the, the bear. So then the chair was prepared for the bear. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Well, we'll let it finish. Okay. So, so, well, that's the same one again. Okay, so I mentioned that we had two objects. One was chair, one was cup. So now let's mo move over to cup. We're actually not looking specifically at cups. We're looking at the class of open containers. So an open container is something that you can pour liquid or granular material into it and it will retain it, right? A cup you could maybe say is more, you can lift it with one hand and drink from it, let's say. Um, this is also my student Hong Tao. Uh, and uh, so uh, let's watch. This is a different robot arm, but it, this is a teaser of what our capability is. Our capability is these previously unseen objects have been classified as open containers, and we simultaneously determine how and where to pour into them without spilling, in this case, M&Ms uh, outside. Okay. previously unseen. It's not in a database. The robot has never seen these before. We can't say it's a cup or whatever, but we can say it's an open container. Okay, so then the question is, how do we do this? Time after time after time, no spillage. Okay, well, there, there's uh, related works in the literature related to physics-based reasoning, uh, and then even so deep learning-based uh, approaches uh, assessing affordances. Um, we're not doing any of that. Okay, what we're doing is we're using uh, we're using Pi Bullet, but it could be any physics-based simulator to simulate the pouring of beads. Those beads could represent actual like M and M's, or it could represent a discretized version of a fluid. For the purpose of assessing whether it's an open container or not, it really doesn't matter. You don't need a finite element code to do fluid mechanics simulation. It can be just using beads. Okay, and uh, so, uh, so basically, what is an open container? 
an open container is an object uh, that you can place liquid or granular material in, poured into it from above and retained if you pick up the object or if you shake it a little bit, okay? So there's no hole in the bottom. If there's a hole in the bottom, then it's not a container, right? Um, so the question the robot asks in this paper is, can I pour into it? And this was a this was a ICRA paper that we published. In fact, it was an RAL paper that we presented at ICRA in 2021. So that's the title: Can I pour into it? Okay. And this was a best paper semi a final or finalist for the human robot interaction uh, area. Okay. Uh, and again, the, the object is previously unseen, and so just like you saw in the previous video, uh, it's pour it's pouring M and M's into the cup. So similar to the chair idea, the robot has a 3D camera on it. It, uh, it takes a scan of the object, okay? It does a reconstruction of the object, and then it puts the object in simulation, okay? So there, there, there are some subtle things about, is it a container? If you have a, a roll of tape, is that a container? Well, if you can't parse the bottom out, you don't know. And here there's an origami little uh, cup here. Is that a container? But in any case, the, uh, the methodology is we have a sheet of beads that we drop onto the object and we see, will the, the object retain the beads or not, okay? And also in the process, we determine uh, where the sweet spot is, where is the center of mass of the subset of beads that were actually caught and contained in the object. And that tells us a little bit about where we should be pouring from. Okay, so the physics-based simulation is what it, we call it imagination because it gives foresight before action. Okay, and uh, you know what is imagination? I mean, I think, well, I think, what if I do this? What if I do that? And then I commit. Okay, it's foresight of action. So uh, this is scanning this uh, this container. I don't even know what that is. Half a coconut or something? Um, is it a container? And well, we drop the beads. Yes, it can contain. We rotate a little bit, it retains them. So we judge, yes, it satisfies the definition of an open container, okay? And then, uh, so that's the same thing again, okay? And then uh, we assess, you know, what percentage of the beads are retained. Uh, we assess where is the, uh, where is the, what is the footprint of the beads that fall into the container and where is the center of mass uh, of this footprint. And we use that as the place to pour from. But then there's also the angle that you pour from. And so we can do simulations of the different angles and, uh, and see what the best strategy is before pouring the real stuff. If you're gonna pour tea for grandma, you wanna make sure that you're pouring in the right place before you commit to, or the, before the robot commits to the real action, okay? And so there's some, you know, probabilistic arguments here about how to get the best one. And then here uh, you see the real action. Again, this half coconut thing was never seen before by the robot. It was scanned, put in, reasoned. And then here the real robot for the very first time is pouring into this previously unknown object, okay? And much like the chair, time after time after time, we get success, 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 okay? Um, and, you know, so we compared this then against what's called affordance net, um, which is a, 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 a deep uh, learning-based approach for assessing affordances. We had, uh, we did training on a set of objects which were containers and, and Sorry, they did training on uh, objects which were containers and not containers to assess, is it an open container? We did no training. We were just presented with each object with no prior knowledge. And then uh, we used our methodology and we both methods get 100% in classification uh, uh, on the trained data sets. Uh, we went further beyond the trained data sets and still got 96%. Their method was not uh, applicable beyond the, you know, the, the, the categories of, of training. Um, and then, uh, so, you know, here, here are some examples. Oops, let me go back to the, it will play. Okay, so then in, in I'll go back one more and then, okay. 
So we did the pouring into the various uh, scanned objects. Uh, you know, this candlestick is this candlestick in open container. I think you could ask humans, and we did ask humans, we did some annotation. Some would say it's an open container, some would say it's not an open container, right? You put a candle in it, is that, is that a, a container or not? Um, and uh, so, uh, and we get uh, these many successes, uh, not 100%, oops, because for example, you have this bottle with this very small neck here, and then the M&Ms, you know, bounce out, okay? So it's not perfect, but 98.15% is not bad. Yep. This is the exact question I wanted to ask for a long time. So what defines the object? If you cannot pour into it, is it not an object? Or did you just not pour properly? Right, so the question is, if it assesses it is a container and then tries to, so there's two levels. One is the classification. And then if it classifies it as an open container because in simulation, it says I was able to pour into it, that's one thing. Uh, and then if you go to the real world and then this, what, what you imagined it was turns out not to be the case, that can happen as well. So there's the classification that's given and then there's the action taken on the classification. You can have failure at either stage. Uh, you know, it's like a mirage, right? You imagine there's a lake coming up and it's not when you get there and you're thirsty. So there's, I mean, the imagination is not going to be perfect, um, but uh, I'm not sure if I answered your question. Uh, kind of, yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, and so the, the gravy bo uh, boat here and the uh, candlestick were sort of edge cases, um, but uh, generally we did uh, quite well. And uh, actually that's all. I didn't time this talk very well because this is the first time. So there's plenty of time for questions. Um, and uh, all the code that we write for all of these things is, is on our GitHub account. And uh, this work has been funded uh, by, the, uh, well, the, the part that's been done in Singapore has been funded by the Singapore National Research Foundation. And uh, we have five years of funding to really develop this make the dictionary have 25 common household items, you know, have uh, not just nows, but fuller scale humanoids and demonstrate more real kind of things like opening medicine uh, bottles and things like that. Please, Rosna. Yes, um, I want to call your attention to Caroline Chen. Okay. C -H -E -N. Okay. She just finished a PhD. Hmm. And she is working now for uh, in London for two months. Okay. Her thesis is exactly about functionality. I have been a long time interested in functionality. And her thesis is about what is plural. So okay. She had uh, about a way of testing, you know. Liquids and what is their viscosity? It's, it's no, it has no um, learning or anything. You know, okay. It's, it's strictly physics based. Okay. And, and the job is to estimate, you know, to, to, to understand what these materials are. Now, she also did, and I'm sure it's continued with this, what is Steerable. Steerable. Yes. And she had some toes, like bread dough. Mm -hmm. And how much, you know, what's the, the combination of water versus flour? And, and how much it is penetrable and compliable. Mm -hmm. And she has all those things detected and the character, the character. Okay, is her thesis available at Berkeley? Like the yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. And we published it. My name is kind of attached, but it's really good for work. Okay. <laughs> um, and she could we, we got the best paper in uh, last ICRA. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I was one of those two. Okay, okay. She got the best, best paper. So, oh, wow. Yeah. 
Okay, I bet my I bet Hong Tao probably knows about it already, but I, I'll look into it yeah, as well. Because it's exactly along the way. Okay. One thing that, that I may just yeah, one sure. little comment is that <clears throat> I love your approach on detecting functionality, basically, which is a flawed basis. What you really don't have is, is the agent mm -hmm. has to, because if you say, what is, is this a chair? Yes. Then immediately, I suppose you could say, chair is an object where an agent can sit. Yes. So then immediately you have this geometric and physics problems, namely how big the person is, how much surface he mm. has to support. And you, you know better than anybody else in this mode mm. how much load it can support. So these are all good old fashioned physical mechanics, mechanical means. And then, my friend, you will get into this problem that I faced, which is chair is not only those geometric objects. Mm -hmm. there, they, uh, you go into woods, and there is a stump. Yes. You can sit on yes. Is it a chair? Or it's certainly sit on Yes. But it's not a chair. Yes, well, there's a semantic argument. Yes, what? Right. Yes, yes. Yeah. But, but you will get into this whether you like it or not. Yeah. Right. Maybe we need, to, instead of calling it a chair, we need to just ask is it suitable? Is it suitable? Then you get all kinds of surfing. Then you describe it really fundamentally mm. as a geometry and physical surface that can yeah, no, there's definitely quite a lot we can do with this yeah. going forward. Absolutely. Yeah. And the same with the cup. And the book, different cups, you know. Uh -huh. For the student, my period, he was, you know, I don't know how, this is history, about 200 years ago, only the handles on the cups introduced by one of the queens. Oh. Because she wanted to hold the cup and she couldn't hold it because it was too hard. Uh -huh. So they developed this. The hand. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Thanks. It's all yeah. physics. Yeah. I'm with you there. I like mechanics. I don't know. I appreciate your suggestions. But it's a very fruitful subject because you have to take the agent. Yes. It's going to be used to the object, which defines the function. Yes. And in the case of the teddy bear, there's the teddy bear has certain properties. There was a kinematic model of what the teddy bear was and things like that. And if the agent if the robot wanted to sit itself, then it would have to be the robot's properties instead. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. I have a question of, um, since a lot of the uh, simulation is based on functionality. Yes. And um, how would you design what kind of simulation to put according to what kind of functionality? For example, the chair case, you um, drop the figures down. Is it the same as like throwing the figure onto the chair, like from sideways and um, like keeping in that position or, um, or in the different angles? Um, now it seems like just dropping. Yes. And um, in that case, can how would you uh, think about different kind of functionality? Now, now we have the cup and the chair. What, what if we want to open the doorknob? Yes. Um, and doorknob has different shapes. Right. Um, how would you design that? Is there some uh, insight you would like you would use for that? Well, doorknob is an interesting one. <laughs> uh, I don't know that I have an answer for that yet. We are looking at coat hangers 
and we're looking at opening medicine bottles and we're, uh, you know, other things like bed, et cetera. But even coming up, what is an essential list of common household items is, uh, is in itself somewhat challenging. Uh, and it, it's also related to how the work is funded. And this is funded in the context of elder care and hospital care. Um, and But then there's a, a paradox there, which is that most of the time, things are standardized in the hospital. You have one kind of tray, one kind of plate, et cetera. So do you really need to imagine some exotic thing? And I talked with one of the doctors at the Singapore National University Hospital. And he said, well, sometimes the patients, they want to bring their own stuff in to feel comfortable. Maybe there's the grandchild's uh, clay coffee mug made in kindergarten or something like that. You know, so uh, that's in the hospital setting. Certainly in the home setting, there's more variety. You might get, uh, you know, some antique vase or, or coffee or teacup or whatever. Um, so, uh, but uh, yeah, so there, I can't tell you uh, up front, you know, how uh, to simulate each of those, each object that we encounter. Doorknob is, is certainly uh, a good one. Um, and uh, the work is actually in coming up with the right simulation environment for each object. That's where most of the work is. After deciding on which objects to, to go for, that's the, that's the big work. So we have five years and $5 million to do it. <laughs> I think we'll come up with a, a way open the door. Thank you. Okay, do we have other questions? And those of you online, uh, you know, feel free to type your questions in the chat and, and I can, you know, help ask it or feel free to ask me and ask your questions. So I, I have one person who is sending questions in the chat. Oh, that's Annie. No, that's me. I just had a message earlier. So I have a question regarding some uh, a little bit uh, te technical part. So, so seems like in the classification phase, and uh, so you use a simulation, and you, for example, the tell the chair whether it's functional right now. So each each simulation seems like you need a label, right? Tell the simulator oh, it works or not. Mm -hmm. Seems like there are a lot of uh, human labeling efforts in the classification process. So well, the labeling what you're calling labeling, I would say, is the de the dictionary definitions. So so you know so sort of like more classical AI, you have expert system and expert system is knowledge base. You know, I mean, I'm a mechanical engineer, and this is more like that than deep learning, let's say. I mean, it's not deep learning at all. So this is like this dictionary you could call is the knowledge base uh, for but expert system. The words are not, it's not popular these days. Um, but yes, the human expert has defined what this kind of object is. And ultimately we wanna have that definition in natural language linked to simulations, the nouns linked to the verbs, so the whole dictionary is like this living thing. And even longer term, you know, when the when grandma asks the robot for a cup of tea and it brings back and it has a, a pan full with tea because it satisfies the definition of you can pour into it and drink from it, then gra grandma tells the robot that's not a cup, that's a pan. So then the definition updates, uh, you know, so there's, there's different loops involved. So it's not just opening the door for five million dollars. There's more. There's more to it than that. Thank you. So you talked about um, you using a chair, or something you can sit on, um, and in your simulation, everything that you're looking at, it, it seemed like it had to have a back um, to it. But like for example, you could sit on a stool or or a table. Yes. Um, but in your simulation, it discounted the table is not a place to sit. So does that mean you also have to crowdsource 
the verbs that you we have to we have to crowdsource the nouns and, and the verbs and, and in fact we haven't crowdsourced anything we just can't okay. use an initial definition based on our intuition but the, the question of distinguishing between a tool uh, sorry a stool and a uh, a chair I think it is actually important. I mean, you could say, I mean, on the one hand, you might say a stool is a kind of chair. On the other hand, you might say, no, uh, it's not. And do you want, you know, do you want the robot to help grandma sit on a table when she <laughs> wants to sit on a chair? I mean, so, so you have to take into context the functionality that you want and shape the definitions accordingly, I think. But yeah, there, you know, it's, it, it very rapidly gets into areas uh, which are, you know, outside of, of my expertise, uh, but uh, we're learning as we go. Thank you. I think there's an interesting cultural implication for the person who is being to the council chair. Anyway, this is the first time I've given this talk and I appreciate the feedback and uh, I can't, these are things I can think about and uh, and we can think about in the group and then modify as time goes on. Thank you. Um, we haven't had a chance to thank you, Greg, for listening. Okay, thank you. <laughs>